So that's a sign. That could be a sign that you are suffering from an identity crisis. Another point is that you get bored easily. So if you always have to be entertained, you, you always have to get a kick or, or you know, some type of amusement to keep you up, um, that could be a sign of identity crisis. Because sometimes when you know, don't know your purpose, um, you don't know what to do in life. So a lot of times you can get bored easily. Um, so the sixth point is that your relationship don't run deep. And you have this surface relationship with someone. And the seventh point is that deep down, you don't trust yourself. So when you have an identity crisis, a lot of times you don't trust yourself because you, you don't have this self-control and you don't know how you're going to act in certain situations because you don't know yourself. But we know that God has a solution um, to that. But question, are you suffering from an identity crisis? Talk to yourself right now. Are you suffering from an identity crisis based on what we've seen today so far? We're going to discuss how to find yourself. The two basic ways to find yourself. It is to... Uh, it is discovering your personality, which includes finding your strength and weakness. So, uh, so the first thing is knowing what you are strong at and knowing where you are weak. And finding your personality type. There is such thing as different, um, different personalities, but we can't go into that um, right now. But the second point is that finding your purpose and your life work. Do you believe that God has a purpose for you? Do you believe that God has a purpose for you? All right, man. You guys are quiet. <laughs> yes, I mean, God is a creator. He's a great designer. And he, of course, created us for a certain purpose. He created, he allowed us, for, for some of us to be born in Haiti, some of us to be born here, or different countries. And we are born to our specific family for a specific um, reason. And God has a purpose um, for, for us. Let us open our Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 25. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 25. From the beginning of this message, I will just tell you how to um, find yourself. And in this verse, you will be able to see how to find your purpose. Let's look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 25. I told you we're going to be reading our Bibles. We see here, Jesus is speaking. And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whatsoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be a cast away? Now in this text, Christ tells us how to follow him. The basic way to find yourself is follow your creator. Does that sound like common sense? <laughs> if you're looking at a tool or a device or a new technology device, if you want to know what is the purpose of it, you look at the manufacturer instructions to know what is the purpose of the device, right? So us as human beings, if Christ is our creator, we must go to him in order for us to know what is our purpose. Does that make sense? And it says here that in order for us to follow Christ, we must deny ourselves first. What does that mean for us to deny ourselves first? This means that we must reject our emotions. Whatever we have learned before, we must put it aside and be ready to learn from Christ. 
Because there are some things that we have learned before and things that we grew up to know in our culture or whatever situation that we're in that can interrupt, that can, inter that can hinder us from following Christ. Now, some people just see following Christ as just a religious thing. Yes, it is something religious, but following your creator will help you in every part of your life, in your social life, in your family, your health, and each part of your life, because God is the creator. Question, who are you following? Who are you following? I know many of us have um, social medias, which is nothing wrong with social media, um, but now we constantly are, we constantly are looking at other people's lives that's, that are not even real. We following, you know, different type of celebrities, different people who put up this face on Facebook and we start to follow something that is not real. And therefore, you lose your identity by following something that is not real. Ask yourself, who are you following? Are you following the creator? Or are you following your favorite movie star or your favorite music star? Israel had an identity crisis. And when they had an identity crisis, they had begun to follow the other nations. They had begun to follow the crowd. And when they start to follow the crowd, they start doing all sorts of type of things that was destroying their connection with God. Destroying, actually destroying their health, destroying their mental health, their social health, and spiritual health. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuter Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 2. Let's see what was God's purpose for Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 2. I love this. I, I love how, what God says to Israel here. He says, and actually Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So God said he wanted to put Israel on the pedestal, the people that everybody wants to follow. And he also says that he wants to put so much blessing upon Israel. You know how we talk about being overwhelmed with stress? God want to overwhelm Israel with blessings. That's what it says. It says in verse 2, And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. But there's a condition here. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. We're always talking about blessing. We're always talking about prosperity. And I want to tell you right now, um, prosperity and blessings in Christ is true. But there's a condition. We must follow him in order to receive these blessings. A lot of us don't, see, don't really see religious things as being um, attractive or enjoy, um, enjoy following Christ or enjoy being a Christian. And you, um, many people have valid points. 
a lot of times we see people in church that, that say they're Christian. They're Christian, but not really following Christ. So therefore, they have a miserable life. So people start to think that, oh, man, Christians are miserable people. And there are people in the church that are, that are miserable. But I tell you this, that I, I tell you this, though. Now, I don't want to sound harsh, but this is the truth. <laughs> Who wants the truth? Raise your hand if you want the truth. All right. Raise your hand if you want me to lie to you. All right. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, if a Christian said they're a Christian and they're miserable, they're not a true Christian. Hey, what did you just say? There's no such thing as being a true Christian and being miserable at the same time. Because once you are following the creator, he's going he's gonna to just bombard you. He's going to begin to bombard you with blessings. But he can't trust you with his blessings if you are not following him. If you are still a selfish person, why is he going to give you blessings? Because the point of God's blessing is for you to be able to attract others to Christ. But if you are worrying about your selfish purpose, of course you're not going to get the blessings of Christ. There are some things you don't have to go through if you just follow Christ. If you just follow his counsel. And in, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 6, quickly I will turn, turn there. God continues to say, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understandings. He's talking about his commandments. In the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. People around are supposed to look at us Christians, us as Seventh-day Adventists, and say to us, these people are wise and understanding. How many, how many times people will look at us and say, these are not some wise and understanding people? People are supposed to be astonished when they look at our lives. Because we are supposed to have solutions um, to the problems uh, of life. We are supposed to be wise people. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it says... And they shall be wise, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So we are supposed to be a light unto the world. We are supposed to attract others to Christ, and people are, others are supposed to be amazed by how we live. So how, we do, how do we get this wisdom? How do we get this wisdom? In Proverbs, in Proverbs 9 verse 10, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that means that we can't have wisdom if we don't have the fear of the Lord. Does that make sense? You can't have wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God, if you don't fear him. And Proverbs 8, verse 13, gives us the definition of the fear of the Lord. It says here, It says here in Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogance, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. So we see here that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So, in order to have wisdom, you must have the fear of the Lord. In order to have the fear of the Lord, you must hate evil. 
If we love the things of the world, we do not have the fear of the Lord. Now, Buju, you judging. <laughs> well, that's what the Bible says. If you love the music of the world, if you love the movies of the world, we can't have the fear of the Lord that way. But the truth is that we naturally hate evil. I mean, we naturally love evil. Once we are born, we naturally are inclined to sin. We love sin. We watch, we love the violence. We love the adultery and fornication that is on the television. But God has a solution. God says in, in my favorite verse in Genesis 3 verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. After Adam and Eve had sinned, after Adam and Eve um, had um, become in a fallen nature and was, and was naturally inclined to sin, Jesus said to the serpent, I will put enmity. The word enmity means hatred. So God said, he's going to make you hate sin. Amen? So it is the supernatural power of God that is going to make us hate sin. God said, I'm going to put enmity. It's not us that's going to put the enmity. So through the help of God, we will be able to hate the things of the world. I remember when um, I was saying this the last time I was here, that I used to love um, hip-hop um, and, and rap. I used to love Listen to the Tupac, Young Jeezy, and um, Lil Wayne. Um, these probably sound like old rappers now, but. Uh, and I used to um, love this type of music. But after God has shown me that this is not the way to go, I ask God for help because it is not in my power that I'll be able to hate these things. Question, do you believe that God can give, give you power to overcome? Do you believe that? God says, and I will put enmity. Can we go to the next slide? There's a great battle between the woman and the serpent. Between the woman and the serpent. We know that the serpent is Satan and the woman is. Let me go back one. All right. And the woman is the church. In Revelation 12, verse 17, it says that, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Satan declares war upon God's people. Satan declares upon you. Do you know that Satan hates you? Do you know that Satan doesn't want you to be saved? Do you know that it is Satan that is robbing your identity? He doesn't want you to know the opportunity to have, that you have in order for, to be in heaven forever with, with God in his kingdom. He doesn't want you to know about everlasting life because he lost it. Understand this, that if, say knows, if we know our identity, we will stop playing around. If we know who we are, we will take a lot of things um, seriously. Us as Seventh-day Adventists, we, we see that in this text, in Revelation 12, verse 17, it describes us as Seventh-day Adventists as those the, the, it describes the people of God as those who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And this church is the only church that fit this description. There are, are a lot of churches that may um, support keeping the commandment of God, but there's those who doesn't have the testimony of Jesus. And in Re Revelation 19 verse 10, we see that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, we know the, we heard of Ellen White um, before. And we heard that she was one of the founders of, of our church. And I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that's, you know, uh, uh, attacking her because, 
you know, Satan wants you to lose your identity. But if you start to research for yourself, you will discover, um, you will discover the advantage you have of um, reading her books. We know in 1844, I mean, I don't have time to do a full study on, on, on the 1844, but um, in 1844, we know that Jesus went from the holy place to the, to the most holy place in heaven. And this was the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, movement. The reason why is because first there was a man named William Miller who was saying Jesus was coming back again, Jesus was coming back again in 1844, but it didn't really happen. But he didn't understand that Jesus was just moving from the holy place to the most holy place. The pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventists start to research why Jesus didn't come back or what really happened in 1844. And when they start to st study a beautiful message called the sanctuary, this is when they found, they, they found the truth. And in the sanctuary, in the most holy place, they found the Ark of Covenant, which have the Ten Commandments. So when we discovered these Ten Commandments, we became um, seventh day Adventists. There's more details into it, but we, don't, we obviously don't have um, time um, for that. But we, we see that um, we do have a true prophet. And if you read these books for yourself, you will know it. You know the benefit we have as God's people? We have the resources to solve people's problems. If someone is having a health issue, some disease like high blood pressure or cancer, we have a book called Ministry of Healing that can help them reverse those diseases naturally. If someone is having some finance problem, we have a book called Councils on Stewardship in order to help them. If a young person is having some trouble, we have a book called Messages to Young People in order to solve the young people's problem. If there's some issues in the family, in the marriage, we have a book called Adventist Home. We got all these resources and Satan is robbing us from it. Instead, he's sending some he said, it's, it's, I don't want to call them names, but some people on YouTube to say that this person is a false prophet. And you actually go believe them, and you didn't even read none of her books. Just rob your identity just like that. And, you're not, and you lose your opportunity in finding your purpose. Isn't that something? God has made us a special people. In 1 Peter 2 verse 9, he says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So God has called us to be this great um, nation who will show forth the glory of God to the rest of the world. He called us to carry this everlasting gospel, the, which is found in Revelation 14, verse 16, verse 6 to 7, to be preached to every nation, kingdom, kindred, and people. So we have a special message that needs to go to the world before Jesus comes back. The reason why Jesus hasn't come back, because we didn't do our jobs yet. The reason why Jesus didn't come back is because we didn't do our job yet. The reason why Jesus didn't come back yet is because we didn't do our job, which is to spread this message. But we must know this message for ourselves in order to preach this message, right? That's why Matthew 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world, and then shall the end come. And Ecclesiastes, song, um, Solomon is telling us, that of all these vanities, all these things that is of the world. We know that Solomon had a lot of experiences. 
He had a lot of women. He had a lot of treasures. He had big houses. He had all these things. And what he concluded is that all is vanity. It says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 8, Vanity of vanity, said the preacher, all is vanity. So why are we going after all these things? Why are we going after all these things that is straight vanity? And it doesn't fill, it doesn't fill us up emotionally. It doesn't fill us up um, socially. We get it and get this temporary excitement and then it fades away. We go to the club and then we excited at the club and then the next day we feel miserable. It feels like something is missing. He continues to say, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So this is the whole duty of man. It's for us to keep the commandments of God. I know when I say keep the commandments of God, it sounds so dogmatic. But, um, but really and truly, keeping the commandments of God will solve your problems. Do y'all hear me? And it will also help you solve other people's problems. As a matter of fact, it's going to make you happy. It's going to make you happy. Because you will be able to experience all these blessings that God has for you. If you keep his commandment. The identity of the last day people. The way the Bible describes as the last people standing in Revelation 14 verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It is those who have the patience. In order to receive God's blessings, you must have patience. You must have the faith of Jesus. You must trust in him. The same faith that Jesus had on the cross is the same faith that we must have in him. Do you believe that God can help you? Do you believe that God can use you to be alive? Are you tired of misery? Are you tired of the vanities of the world? If you are tired of, of, of the things of this world, let us follow Christ. Let us keep his commandments because this is our whole du duty. Take time today, today and tomorrow. Read a chapter of the Bible every single day. Grow stronger in the Lord. Pick up a book called Messages to Young People. Read a chapter of Messages to Young People every single day. And you will grow spiritually and God will be able to help you in your everyday life. Take this experiment. I encourage you to follow Christ wheresoever that he goes. Don't listen to the lies of the world. Don't listen to the fakeness of the world because the fakeness of the world is not going to fix your problems. So if you want to commit today to follow Christ all the way, to follow your creator, that you may find your true purpose, I ask you to please stand. If you want to find your purpose, if you want to find your purpose by following your creator, please stand. And God will help you. God will help you find your identity. And God will help you experience these great blessings. Blessing number 290, turn your eyes upon Jesus. We must turn our eyes upon Jesus so the things of this world will go strangely dim. The more you look at Jesus, the less you're going to look at the world. I know the world just seems like it's just so all in your face, all in social media, all in YouTube, and all over your school or whatever. But if you turn your eyes upon Jesus, those things are going to fade away. And it's going to be nothing to you anymore. Oh.
Father, which are in heaven, oh, we thank you for the word you have given us. We thank you for giving us this information so that we may know that we can find our identity in you. Oh, Lord, we are helpless. Oh, Father, we don't know what is left and what is right. We don't know the future. We don't know the things that's going around us. We don't know the plot of Satan, but we know that you do. So we are coming humbly to you, asking you to please help us. You see that we take a stand today and that we want to make this covenant with you that you may be our shepherd and that we shall not want, that we shall not want the things of this world, that the things of this world will go strangely dim. Oh, Father, come take over our life, oh, Father. Give us the power to keep your commandments and that we may be ex able to experience the great blessings that you have in store for us. Oh, Father, hear our prayer today. Bless Sinai youth today and that Sinai youth may be a light in this community and that people may say that these people are wise and understanding people. Oh, Father, please hear our voice and we are coming to you not in our name, but in the name of Jesus, amen. Lift up your hands before the Lord for, for the benediction. And now may the, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day.
happy Sabbath. See you guys later at our midnight cry. And if there's any visitors, I'm going to ask you guys to please stay for a couple minutes. If there's any visitors, please stay and come towards the front. Thank you.